Thanks for watching Henry AI Labs podcast. This podcast is where I interview experts in deep learning and we get to the bottom of important papers in deep learning. I'm here with Edward Feek. Edward is a PhD student at the Biomedical Research Center at the University of Nottingham. Edward wants to see artificial intelligence acquire and reconstruct MRI scans. Edward trained as a clinical scientist in the NHS, specializing in imaging with non-ionizing radiation. His current PhD research in MRI of osteoarthritis is using deep learning for image reconstruction, segmentation, and predicting diseases progression. Edward, thank you so much for doing this with me and uh, maybe helping more people understand how deep learning is being applied to medical image analysis. Uh, great, thank you. So uh, it's so nice to be on the stream. Been looking forward to it. Yeah. Great. So the first paper we're going to talk about is a really famous paper, the uh, dermatologist level skin cancer classification using convolutional neural networks. So first, I just wanted to ask you uh, what things about the paper really stood out to you as being interesting. Um, I think it was just interesting because it was uh, it was kind of like a, a step change from from the previous studies. So previously, there had been a few hundred, uh, like a few thousand um, images in in those studies, and they, they sort of they brought the number up to like 130,000, um, which is quite impressive. And with that extra, um, those ex that extra data, they were really able to kind of leverage um, the power of deep learning, but they were also able to use images. So normally in sort of medical imaging, you think about MRI, CT, where you've got really nice pictures, uh, even sort of like the standard um, like lab-based images for, for moles. They weren't doing that. They were using kind of like these these camera, camera phone images. So they were, uh, difficult to work with, you know, there was changes in image intensity, in uh, in size, and sort of zoom. So it was it was a really messy problem, and they, they really got to to uh, to the bottom of it, I think. So yeah, one thing I uh, thought was interesting is that they use this pre-trained inception network such that they have to resize the images to that 300 by 300 resolution scale. Do you think that if they took advantage of the full resolution that the smartphones are capable of producing, it would have a better result? Yeah, so I think that's that's a really interesting question because the if you think about the size of a of like a skin lesion or a, or a mole, it's quite small, so you don't need that many pixels to to show it. So what's really important is mm. the getting the texture, get, uh, getting and getting the boundary between that that and the um, the surrounding skin. So I think some of those features are really important. And if you're if you're resizing it and you lose you lose that boundary between the between the sort of the, the skin mole that might be malignant or not and the skin then you you might be losing some of that information so using the the full size image might be um possibly better but then also you've got to think about you know they wanted to use the the image net which is a fixed size and it has all the advantages of the pre-trained pre-trained network so i think they were trying to balance the two and they ended up in the favor of, of using this uh yeah the pre-trained one so that was another question i had i i was curious like they pre-trained from image net but do you think maybe like that if I've seen there is a the checks as they spell it like Chexpert uh, chest uh, image data set from Stanford where it's like these medical image image data sets. Do you think like so that kind of data set would be better for transferring? Like I know that they so they have 130,000 of these skin cancer lesions, but yeah. some other things like liver lesion or I don't know like uh, brain hemorrhage has even less than that. Do you think that they should transfer from the skin lesion data set or the image net data set? If let's say you're looking at brain hemorrhage detection in like a CT scan. Yes, yeah, so that's another really interesting thing. So what was particular about the um, the skin cancer classification problem is that it's a, it's a color problem. So you have um, mm. three, you have your three channels, X, Y, Z, whereas with your, your MRI, your CT, you don't have that. It's just a grayscale image. So the, the problem of, of training was was really well utilized, I think, using the, the image net. They were able to take um, the information. So I think some of the some of the feature extraction um, information in the image net is to do with is a lot to do with color. So uh, you don't have that in a in a classical um, sort of like um, like liver lesion or something. So it's mm. it's more about the intensity of the pixels and um, how they look relative to to the ones around them rather than um, you know how dark it is, how brown it is, or you know is there bits of white in it. It's it's a different kind of problem. I think that. Yeah, they they used um, an interesting tool. I don't think it, I don't think training on um, on ImageNet is is as easy for kind of grayscale medical images. That's really interesting. So I was also reading into the data augmentations that they use, and now that you bring up the uh, the color being so important, I, it clarifies a lot for me because when I saw the data augmentations, 
they rotate it between zero to 360 degrees and then they do horizontal flipping and that's it. That's all the data augmentation they use. And yeah. so I, when I first read that, I was like, why not do like some kind of histogram equalization, maybe a brightness thing. So do you think if they did these color augmentations in the data space that it would dis that it would ruin the classifier? No, I think it would improve it. So I think that the, oh, I don't know if it'd improve it, but my, my guess is that the, <laughs> more, right, yeah. the, the more you normalize your, your images, um, so it's about the, the quality of the images that you put in. So if they had um, kind of images that all looked um, the same, so if they did the end, uh, normalization of, of certain colors, then it might help because I think with us, the problem is that with different smartphones, they have inbuilt filters on them. And so when you're taking a, a picture, you, you don't quite know, you know, it, it might look really good, like something you could put on Instagram, or that's, but then actually there's loads of processing that's going on in the background and taking some of that out might actually help uh, improve the uniformity. Because mm. uh, I think, yeah, with the learning, it's 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 difficult because um, yeah, every photo kind of looks, looks different, even if it's the same, the same condition and the same lesion. Mm. So I want to uh, just backtrack, uh, pivot out one step, just to discuss yeah. again about the assembly of these kind of data sets. Because yeah. I read in the ImageNet paper that when they employ the Amazon Mechanical Turk to label data sets, they're able to label 50 images per hour. So okay. I was wondering if maybe you could provide some insight as to how long it would take these radiologists to classify these images and how much that slows down the image labeling process in medical image analysis. Yes, I think having a radiologist there does it does slow it down because um, well having a radiologist in the picture it's not just the time that it takes the radiologist to to look at the scan so that might be you know if they had a, a lab based image they could do you know maybe a several hundred in an hour um, so it's not it's not that they're slow it's that you need to get the pictures so typically they were the patient would go to the hospital they would go to the photography lab they'd go under a special lighting condition and you know the photo would be taken so it's, it's the, the patient journey and it's the amount of through flow you can get out of that compared to someone taking a, a snap of a of a photo on their hand is it's a very different kind of environment and lets you get into places you wouldn't otherwise um, have kind of that support yeah. hmm. so my question then is um we talk about the inference time of these neural networks how quickly they can make their prediction so the radiologist yeah. inference time is very quick to make yeah. a decision yeah so the, i think um they might sort of pan around the image a little bit. They would look at the borders and then they'd make their decision sort of within, you know, maybe within 20, 30 seconds. Um, but then if they were unsure, then they'd have to, they'd have to get a second opinion uh, and that would be someone else that they'd go to. And actually what we see in the paper is that the radiologists aren't very good at this task. So, um, right, yeah. <laughs> so you, you know, there's the, the, the ground truth is the biopsy. So they, mm -hmm. there's, there's some lesions that look very similar. So for example, some inflammations look just like the malignant um melanomas are the ones that are really but they also know the ones that are really bad so it's kind of like a more complex problem because often if they're not sure then they'll get it biopsied whereas if a, if an ai isn't sure you have to it has to tell you that it's not sure it's kind of thing so mm. yeah well that's another interesting thing to think about the importance of uncertainty in these medical image analysis sort of like a bayesian neural networks do you have any sort of areas of uncertainty in deep learning that interests you uh, so for myself, um, I've not tried Bayesian um, networks before. I think they're quite difficult to train. And I've only just, I'm mm -hmm. sort of six months into into a PhD where deep learning is more of a, uh, something that I'm learning rather than something that I'm, I'm really good at doing. But I think right. that what you see from, from doctors in the imaging community is that they really want to, they don't believe um, the things that you, you know, the things that an AI might tell them, they just say, well, you know, how do I know that? Whereas if you put an uncertainty on it, if you can give sort of like a, mm. yeah, uncertainty histograms or uncertainty plots, then they're much more likely to believe you because you're quantifying the the, the error on your prediction, which is always something that's important, I think. Well, well, I think outside of Bayesian deep learning, which I also find to be qu quite difficult to really do, I yeah. like two other approaches to uncertainty prediction. I like um, leaving dropout in the test time and yeah. having an aggregate of predictions with dropout still enabled. And then the second one I like is um, test time augmentation. So you take the image you'd like to predict and then you do like 10 distortions to it and aggregate these predictions. Do you think either of these are promising for uh, for these kinds of applications? Yeah, I think um, with the dropout you see um, sort of a measure of the uncertainty. Um, uh, and other than, other than that, I think, yeah, the, the other one is actually new to me. So, but I do see, you do see people using dropout and, and when they, 
when they do that and they give you an uncertainty, it's much more um, sort of reassuring because you know, mm -hmm. um, you know that rather than just having a sort of like a well pass fail, you, you get some sort of measure on that and you can see the the error bars. Do you think it could also be interesting to like divide up the data and then train different neural nets on different subsets of the data? So sort of like a data partitioning rather than like sort of I'd say model partitioning is what we do with the dropout. Like we're partitioning inside our own model rather than in the data space. Yeah, so I think I think partitioning is important. So just the, the most simple partitioning that I, I can think of is that um, you just you have your, you know, you can do your cross validation uh, with different folders and things. But then at the end of at the end of the day, you want to like um, you don't want that to be part of your model. You don't want your um, your validation or your test set to be part of your model. So you always want mm -hmm. that to be kind of separate. And I think that's that's really important here. And I think in the paper, they, they run a couple of different experiments here and they use ninefold uh, cross validation. So if the, right. if, if the if the AI has if the deep network has already seen some of that data, even if you're cross validating, it's it's kind of like a you're cheating the system a little bit. So mm -hmm. they, they do they do hold the, some uh, some biopsy proven images to one side and, and test it on that. But I think that's kind of like the gold standard that you have to be aiming for. And if you're doing any yeah cross validation, then um, you know be ready to not be believed as much when you say you've got a really good um, AUC value. <laughs> so yeah, one other thing I think is interesting is the class imbalance problem and how okay. they discuss the use the AUC which is, uh, if for people who don't know, it's a, like a class imbalance metric that trades off your uh, specificity and selectivity, sensitivity, I think, which is like a true positive rate, false, true negative rate type of trade-off. But do you think that class imbalance is gonna be a big problem with these data sets? Because when I think about taking a picture of a skin lesion, I think that most of the time it's not gonna be a malignant tumor. Most of the time it'll be just a normal mold. Yeah, yeah and that's, that's the problem with, um... That's that's a massive problem that they have is that um, if you if you were to go down a conventional route of going to your doctor and going oh, I have this and then they look at it you're much more likely probably to have the um, to have some problem with your with with your with your with your skin lesion but if you just uh, if you just download the app onto your phone right you're going to take a picture <laughs> of every single mole lump and bump you've got and and then it becomes a different problem because the amount of of, uh, of true positives has gone right down the amount of um, so, so you you might be changing the the number of lesions compared to the number of of just benign or you know not lesions, and that that imbalance is something that you have to account for. So your training data needs to reflect the actual cl the clinical data you'll be using. Otherwise, you end up getting lots of uh, false negatives where you're either saying oh you don't have the condition and you do, and that's really bad because you might have something like a malignant melanoma, or you're you're just sending loads of people saying yeah you've got you know, if you train the other way and you have lots of people, you have a data set where there's lots of malignant um, images and not so many that are benign, then you end up saying to lots of people, oh, you need to go into the clinic because this might be suspicious. Whereas mm -hmm. in actual case, you know, it's not. <laughs> it, is a, it is a tricky one, a really, really difficult problem. Yeah, I do think that, um, that I definitely agree that they should be optimizing towards uh, true uh positive rate if i'm correct like yeah. avoid uh false positives at the yeah. expense of more misconstitutions but um so I, I think that the trend in these data sets will be to be heavily skewed like uh in the paper i think their data set is hardly more than like 20 percent imbalance yes yeah, so I, I think, think yeah. yeah yeah so it's it's it's, a, it's nearly all of them uh are not so it's, it's very imbalanced but that's actually quite good because it represents the the, the images that they get that, that represents kind of like the population um, so the imbalance represents the population that you have, I think. So there are very few lesions that are harmful compared to a large number of lesions that are benign. Right. I, yeah, my just comment on it is that I suspect if it becomes a phone app that this distribution will get even more skewed towards, uh, you know, the, posit the malignant case being extremely rare. Yeah, I think so. I think so too. And that's something they need to take into account and possibly have uh, retraining. So every so often um, you go back to your original um, CNN and you retrain it based on the new data that you've acquired. And somehow there has to be follow up on those on those cases as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely think it's an interesting thing to think about. Uh how you retrain your model when it's in production and then you're getting new data. Yeah. Be because um, 
I also think with this case, it's tricky to you. It classifies the data, and then it's tough to get a ground truth label on it when you're trying to like put it back into the uh, data store where it's being trained on. Because you might need like another radiologist to really, or another radiologist in this case, but a dermatologist to uh, confirm that it was correct or not. Yeah, I think one of the one of the things we see though is that in the in the second validation problem they run is that the I just wrote it down here the two dermatologists they got 53% and 55% accuracy on a nine class problem so they had nine different groups of and so they so if you do it by chance you get 10% um, accuracy rate because you'd be getting one in ten right and they get 53% so part of that indicates that the ground truth isn't as true as it might be so you so for the ground truth they for the for the testing data, the 2K that they actually test their model on, it's the um, it's the ones that have been biopsied, so you know exactly mm -hmm. what the what the lesion is. But on the uh, on the other ones, it's just other radiologists that have been labeling them, and, and sometimes lesions they look like other lesions, and so you don't know which one it is. Um, and I think that 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 also affects your the ability of your um, your your neural net to learn properly because if you've got mislabeled data then all of a sudden it's making inferences oh i know what that one looks like but it's been mislabeled and so it actually it can't do better than the radiologists and that's what you see you know you see that mm -hmm. the on the nine class problem the cnn accuracy is 55 percent, which is the same as the dermatologist right but it does uh defeat the radiologist on the three-way problem it, which is it does easier yeah 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 three-way problem is easier because it's they're fewer categories, and so they're, mm -hmm. there's less likely to less likely to make an error. Yeah, yeah it's pretty interesting to think about uh, the classification of the real dermatologist. I, when I read the paper, I had to like call to my girlfriend. Like, Can you believe that it's only 66% that the dermatologist will cl correctly classify your uh, skin lesion? Yeah. Is this the trend in in like how many other medical image classification domains like the uh, lung scans the liver lesions the brain scans how what is the usual baseline for, from the doctors in their classification accuracy so so what you see what you have to do is you have to read the the literature so if something gets accepted into a, a clinical test because it's it's better than um you know, it's better than nothing but often it's they're quite good so you know often sensitivity and specificities will be in the 80 90 percent for any given disease um and if it's not if it's not if it's a screening test then it needs to be highly um, specific so you're not getting rid of um, so you're not turning down people at the screening point um, which is I think what they're trying to do here but I think what's what's also really interesting if I can on the um, so this is in uh, extended data figure two you have like um, a comparison of the CNN and the dermatologist as a, um, a confusion matrix. Right, right. And, and what you see is that the malignant um, melanomas, so those are the ones that account for just 5% of the cancers, but they cause three quarters of the death. So they're the ones that you really want to catch. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a problem between a class seven and eight where you need to dis decide between a malignant melanoma and a non-malignant melanoma, a skin, skin tumor. And... Um, the, der the dermatologists, they all put them into the malignant category. And so what you see is that you see it's very highly accurate for the one that's likely to kill you. But for the one that's benign, mm -hmm. it's really bad because it's it's just that differentiation. And the CNN doesn't do that. It just equally puts it into the both groups. So in a way, having a, a dermatologist look at your scan is, is still preferential, pref preferable because if you look at the mortality outcomes from a dermatology-led service and an, and an AI app-led service, the the dermatology one would still probably save your life, whereas the AI one might not balance those groups. But don't you think you could skew the uh, the decision boundary towards having a bias towards getting the, like if it? I think in this nine-way classification confusion matrix, it's trying to classify every class with equal importance. But don't you think if you weighted that class as being the most important, it would be more? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think I think that's just what it's one small step, isn't it? It's just changing the threshold on that particular class problem. And I, they've not done it in that confusion matrix problem, but I think, yeah, it'd be easy to do. And it, it's just things like that that you have to make sure you, you get right when you implement uh, an AI app as a medical product. Right. And something that, that really interests me with this is I just feel like as they add more data, like if this was a, a, a scale of millions of instances and then they the research community would you know, sort of move more away from ImageNet classification and into this kind of problem, 
and then would deploy things like neural architecture search, auto augment, all of this like state of the art things that they use to tell if it's a cat or a dog and maybe pivot it into this. I feel like it would be that, that just adding more data. And then I just feel like that the whole like ensemble of strategies hasn't really been thrown at this problem yet. Have you seen no. any papers that are really impressive with the deep learning use? Yes, so the, I think the next one we're going to talk about with the the lung cancer screening that that used so many different types of models that that it boggled my brain. You know, it was <laughs> yeah. it, it used it used a lot of um, of different um, CNNs and it, it linked them all together and it made sort of like a, a really highly accurate picture. And, and here they've just done transfer learning on ImageNet, which is one of the first kind of go to easy ways that you would train network. Um, but I do think with the you know high quality augmentation, um, they could do you know, they could do better on this problem. Um, but then also just using, if there are ways of using um, AI for small data sets as well. So they've got this, they've got their 3K, they, so they've only got 3000 images, but they're the ones that are really high quality um, ones that they've got biopsies for. So they know the absolute ground truth. So maybe it's not about building a bigger repositories with an uncertain ground truth. It's about building a higher quality repository where the ground truth is, is known. So making a so what you see often is that that people try uh, really hard with like the human connecting project to get really good quality data where you know exactly what the ground truth is and um, yeah that's that's really important that's something that the community is really striving towards I think mm -hmm. yeah I'm definitely excited about this new uh, Chexpert uh, chest radiograph data set released uh, maybe about half a half a year ago from Stanford and I just really am interested in this trend so just to pivot. Um, now I'd like to talk more about the uh, Google paper on their lung cancer. Yeah. And unfortunately, uh, you can really only access a blog post of this unless you'd like to pay for the article or if you have, uh, you know, university access, you can get it for free. But, but anyway, so the most interesting part of this paper to me was to condition your prediction on a previous prediction. So if I have Edwards, uh, his uh, chest radiograph from six months ago, and now I'm going to take it again. I can condition on that information to tell what's changed and maybe use that as an auxiliary prior in my prediction. Yeah, I thought I thought that was really clever too. I thought it was good how they, they built a model where you could take uh, either the, the current CT uh, or you could take the current and the previous. Um, but what I thought was, was really surprising is that with the previous, it actually did worse. Um, so if you look at like the um, the AUC values, the area under curves, it's a measure mm -hmm. out of 100 for how well the... Um, for how well the the CNN performs um, on the uh, on the single volume CT, so that's just the one uh, low dose CT scan at screening. It does like 95.9, so it's really high, very mm -hmm. accurate. But if they include the price, it goes down to um, to like 92.6. And on the first one, so just using the current knowledge, it beats the uh, the six. Uh, radi radiologists uh, mm -hmm. but on, on the second problem with the prize it doesn't so what they actually I spent a ages reading through it and they just included this little line which says um, well we did um, did know performance decrease um, in the with prior subset we found a corresponding drop in performance for our readers um, it may be because patients with Easter spot uh, cancers are diagnosed and dropped from the study in the baseline years uh, leaving only more subtle cases so what, what you see is the people who have priors Mm -hmm. are people who are not the easy cases so right. it's, uh, is it do they have a tumor we'll put them in um the um lumus bucket which is like how likely we think they have a malignant tumor of one or two and that means we'll send them back for a scan whereas the ones that only have the one scan um are probably in the high the high risk ratios and develop um lung cancer or have lung cancer at the one year and, and aren't sent for a follow-up scan so they don't have the price so they're the more difficult cases so even though so really what you want to be seeing is between the first one with just the without the prize you're beating the radiologist but when you have the prize the radiologist can do just as good a job as the ai so that's a quick summary of the two right yeah i but i still think the idea is worthwhile i think that it's just yeah. uh yeah a matter of getting the model right and getting I will because just already having this kind of data set is just an exorbitant like the size of data you need is is crazy to really train the priors yeah I think it's it's amazing they had a what what I don't know what size the data set was it was um it was pretty big it was um and the yeah the priors as well it was it was good because I think you know radiologists perform well when they've got um 
time series data so they can look at it before and after whereas getting the ai to perform well with time series so before and after is actually a really difficult problem the way mm -hmm. they train the weights simultaneously i think was yeah it was good yeah i think the uh the attention layer is uh, in the the things that they're developing to work on time series is pretty interesting like uh especially like borrowing things from speech classification and then trying to adapt it to a uh, sequence of images. It sort of reminds me of like a video classification because yeah. it, yeah, it sort of is the same sort of idea, except I just think that the thing that makes using this prior so challenging is that I think there's other variables on include Like I'd like to see, and I'd like to know what you think about this. Like they call about this, like a uh, multimodal streams, like, maybe to feed the image of the scan as well as the electronic health record and try to blend two inputs. Yeah, I think that's something that, that is, um, again, gaining traction. It's something that's really interesting. So for, for lung CT, it might not be the only thing. So you've got to think about when you, normally when you do a problem, you want to re regress out things that are likely to be linked, but like to find the, the course. But in this case, we want to include things that might want to be linked. So you might want to know age, gender you might want to know smoking because you know that's really important mm -hmm. all really important priors um and not not having those i think sometimes it might bias the opinion so you might think oh this person's a smoker therefore i'm more likely to go mm -hmm. with without without the evidence but actually if you've got the if you can give that to an objective um cnn that's not going to make that dis determination that those um judgments and i think it could be really good so in this paper the the radiologists had those when they were making their decisions and the um the neural network didn't and i think building them in at the appropriate point in the network is what's difficult because there's not that many mm -hmm. of them so smoking is just one category yes or no and at the end of the at the end of the detection i think they had it at 1500 features so if you've only got one one feature it's about yeah which which health records and where do you put them to get them to train properly Right, yeah, I think of uh, there's so many different ways of injecting it. You can either like mesh it with the input in the beginning, you can like sequentially put it at each layer, maybe you mesh it right towards the output. It's tough to think of how exactly you would integrate it. But then, so there's the electronic health records, and I might be uh, grasping for a branch here, but do you think that the genetic code would be valuable? Like the, you know, A, C, C, G, T, A? Yeah, so it's not all, it's, so that is often done. Um... So yeah, genetic is it's really interesting. So what they're certain to find is um, loci in the, so you look at the, the genes, then you try and find mm -hmm. um, things that have a, a really high p-value. So they split it up and they find little loci where there's a significant difference between groups. And then they can put, so using your genes, you can also put that in as an extra, um, mm -hmm. an extra step in the network. So whether or not your susceptibility to developing something in the future can be to do with a, your genetics. So they start, you know, every year they're identifying more and more that are linked to all sorts of diseases, including uh, massive, massively including cancers. So including that information is, but it's maybe a little bit early because we don't have that many sort of loci that are sort of highly accurate for a particular disease. But I think including it in the future will be something that we, we see more and more is bringing together the imaging and the the genetics as well as so, the patient so in the blending of the imaging and the genetics i'm curious like uh how challenging it is to get the microarray expression like would this take you weeks to do and how expensive would it be no i think it's done it's done uh now it's slightly outside of my field um but i think it's done pretty cheaply now so i think for mm. uh, you know 50 dollars or something you can have your your dna sampled um and then you put it through they've they've got um sophisticated tools for doing the the imputations to try and work out where these loci are but once you know where they are it's a really simple problem of just going to that area and putting out that that information for, the, for that patient so you instead of dealing with several gigabytes of uh code you're only dealing with little snippets that you believe are significant for your problem so it's it's much easier to train if you're already if you're already using data that you think is important yeah, I definitely like to see uh, one of these papers that tries to blend all three of these things between the electronic health records, the medical images, and then the microarray. Or even I'd like to see the ACCC. <laughs> if that, I don't, I'm not sure if it is more informative or not. But I just think it's more in the class of raw data that a deep neural network would thrive on. And then I'm definitely trying to design like a God's view system now. But if it had like the 
like the Apple Watch uh, fitness data, do you think that would somehow also enhance it? Because it has like your heart rate, yeah. all sorts of things that could be. Well, yeah, maybe in the future. Um, but at the moment, I think there was, a, there was a story with the Apple Watch where it was sending lots of people to clinics um, for things that weren't, that weren't. So it was picking up loads of things and it was saying, mm-hmm. oh, maybe, maybe this is something. And it was it, it, people, the clinic were getting too busy because they were trying this Apple Watch device and it was, so the sensitivity was, was too high. So it had lots of people who would say, oh, maybe there's something wrong with you. And they were absolutely fine. And I think that, that that's often the risk of putting something that you've tested in a lab environment, maybe in a hospital environment and putting it out into the, the real world because people in hospitals and people in those environments are pretty sick. And, uh, and then you go and put it in the real world and it, you get loads of um, false positives. So I think that it would be really good. And I think there's, there's for certain things, you can see these smart devices becoming really useful. So for example, predicting epilepsy just before someone gets an epileptic shock, but that's, you know, that's not AI driven, that's driven by um, just more conventional things. But I think, yeah, you, building building in AI to these devices um, to pick out more subtle things and sort of patterns over longer periods of times is, is a problem that's really interesting and uh, has great value. It's also interesting as I think about these, like the potential of using all this different kind of data, there are other people who view it as they're worried about the security, the safety of this data and collecting all this different kind of data and storing it in a single place that could be hacked into. Have you looked into uh, federated learning at all, just out of curiosity? So, so, so what's federated? Is that where you uh, split it up? Sort of like a way of distributing the data, like in like a, you know, some kind of encrypted way of making it so you can have the, all of this data, which is really sensitive, but without, um, you know, making it easily accessible to anyone, I suppose. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting problem. Um, I know about the problems of holding data, but I've never thought about how you'd actually solve the problems of, of encrypting sort of these large amounts of data. But in the another, yeah, I don't know if you know more about that than... I mean, you can tell the. Oh, no, I'm not too sure about that. I'll probably (laughs) cover it later. Federated learning should jurisdict its own episode. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Okay. But one of the things we do 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 in in the hospital is that we have uh, a new piece of law that came out that was a bit frustrating in the UK, uh, GDPR uh, 2019. It was was about data security. And actually in there, there's a a little paragraph that I thought was quite interesting. It was um, no decision about your healthcare can be made um, by an artificial intelligence if you don't want it to be without your approval. So that's got massive implications for what these AIs can actually do. So if you, you can't just take the doctor out of the picture. So if the patient says, oh, you know, I don't want that. I don't want to be part of some algorithm that's going to tell me, send me an email. Oh, you're going to die in two weeks time because we just put this out of your medical <laughs> records. You know, I, I, without yeah. a doctor first looking at that picture and going, okay, the AI is not talking rubbish it's actually you know this is fine and so i think that's really interesting in terms of um data security is not just how you store it but actually what you do with it because what you could do with it could be quite harmful if it was in the if it was misused yeah Mm -hmm. so then uh wrapping up i wanted to ask you this question uh like what do you think is the future of deep learning what area interests you the most that you think is going to have an enormous impact on the field of deep learning okay so um I think that combined deep learning, so when you bring together the genetics, when you bring together the imaging, maybe in the community, and you bring together sort of patient characteristics, so that might not just, that might not be a questionnaire about how they're feeling, it might not be trying to find out if they're depressed by doing a standard questionnaire, it might just be looking at their, you know, their, their Facebook feed, which is maybe quite scary, but, you know, looking at the person as a whole, so instead of having, um, so, so you can tailor the, um, you can tailor the the intervention based on the information you know about the patient that's that's collected within the clinic and outside of it. I think that's quite exciting, and I also think that it's it's able to to replace very complicated um, processes. So, for example, where I work in MRI, we we spend um, a lot of resources trying to get from the raw signal to the image, and I think we're seeing that with AI, that's all being done automatically with these uh, deep neural networks and that's quite exciting just replacing parts of systems with um with cnns yeah. hey great uh thank you again so much for doing this it was really great to meet you and get to talk to you about these things all right cheers yeah great